Hello, I'm Dr. Beatrice Madrazo. I'm at the University of Miami, where I'm, I am an associate professor of clinical radiology. And my lecture will be on the value of Doppler in abdominal sonography. The value of Doppler in abdominal sonography. These will be individual cases that I've collected over the years that uh, demonstrate the value of uh, Doppler and color Doppler. Case number one is of a patient who has undergone a nephrectomy and now is found to have a liver mass. The liver mass was seen on CT and then the patient was uh, brought to ultrasound for further evaluation because there was a suspicion that the mass may be of vascular uh, nature. We can see that there is an unechoic lesion in segment 3. Yet, despite its unechoic appearance, it's arguable if there is acoustic enhancement. So the absence of the acoustic enhancement, which could lead us to think this is a cyst, makes us then further evaluate this with color Doppler. And in fact, this is very rewarding because this is not a cyst. This represents a vascular lesion in segment 3, and we can see even some of its additional components, a large draining vein. So an arteriovenous malformation that on CT was uh, considered as a possibility, but the fact that uh, renal cell carcinomas are known to have uh, vascular metastasis led us to further evaluate this finding with ultrasound, a very rewarding diagnosis of a simple arteriovenous malformation of the liver. Other examples that I've collected over the years, here this patient is uh, seen to have at the very anterior margin of segment 2 a vascular area in her liver. Patient returns for uh, additional evaluation years later and the sonographer is surveying the same area yet she only uh, used a 5 megahertz transducer and except for a slight bulge to the contour of the liver we're not really showing the vascular malformation that is known to be present. When we switch to a higher frequency transducer, a 10 megahertz linear array, we can now discern on grayscale the presence of the mass. Color Doppler displays to great detail the nature of the mass, the presence of multiple vascular channels, somewhat disorganized, that compose this isolated hepatic arteriovenous malformation. Sampling with spectral Doppler demonstrates is no uh, low uh, resistance flow pattern, typical of vessels that have uh, very elastic walls because they are composing an arteriovenous malformation. So low resistivity indices in these vascular malformations. So isolated hepatic arteriovenous malformations. Case number two is also a very rewarding case for sonography. The patient had undergone a recent abdominal CT, which was read as normal. We were asked to survey the patient because of uh, additional concerns by the clinicians, and we can see that there are tubular structures within the hepatic parenchyma that do not correspond to any of our normal vascular hepatic structures. Note also that some of these become quite large towards the hepatic periphery. This is the gallbladder. So these large tubular structures throughout the hepatic parenchyma made us further evaluate this finding and uh, we also noted that there was a disproportionate larger caliber to the middle hepatic vein relative to the right and left hepatic veins. Color Doppler displays to great detail the presence of multiple vascular malformations throughout the hepatic parenchyma, 
corresponding to the unechoic tubular structures that were seen by grayscale. And these vascular malformations were the reason why there was such a tremendous volume of uh, blood egressing out of the middle hepatic vein, which caused it to be quite large. As we uh, surveyed the porta hepatis, we were surprised, this is our second case of this entity, to find the typical, the characteristic finding in this population. This finding is a hypertrophied hepatic artery. Noted that this hepatic artery is larger than the portal vein, which is seen here. This hypertrophied hepatic artery is the hallmark of this condition. We're talking about Osler Weber Rendu and its findings in the liver parenchyma. So we have here CT study, which was, as I said, interpreted as being normal, but upon re retrospective review, it was not normal. This large vessel at the porta hepatis is the hepatic artery, while this vessel further into the porta hepatis represents the portal vein. In the normal setting, the hepatic artery averages 6 millimeters, and the portal vein, as we know, 12 millimeters or less. So this hypertrophied hepatic artery is very characteristic of Osler Weber Rendu because of the shunts. There is a, a steal from the aorta, preferentially through the hepatic parenchyma due to these multiple arteriovenous or arterial portal vascular malformations. For comparison, you can see on the CT that the hepatic artery equals or is even a little bit larger than the main portal vein. Throughout the hepatic parenchyma, we had multiple small uh, vascular malformations that you can appreciate here in segment 4B. And some of these extend to the hepatic surface, capsular surface. And uh, the more typical appearance of the peripheral arteriovenous malformations, which are the telangiectatic versions, the small areas that are known to exist throughout the hepatic parenchyma in this entity. Again, these are little telangiectatic areas throughout the substance of the liver corresponding to these vascular malformations. And again, the discrepancy of the middle hepatic vein being larger than the right or the left due to most of these vascular malformations draining via the middle hepatic vein. Autosomal uh, dominant Osler Weber Rendu occurs in families. It is also known as hemorrhagic hereditary telangiectasias. The hepatic disease demonstrates widened and tortuous hepatic arteries. There can be either arteriovenous or arteriopodal fistulas, both intra or extrahepatic, as well as multiple small telangiectatic areas in the hepatic parenchyma. Osler Weber Rendu is a connective tissue proliferation that results eventually in fibrosis and cirrhosis. The patients may experience high cardiac output due to these shunts, and eventually these patients will uh, uh, develop portal hypertension. Hepatic involvement varies from 8 to 37 percent. Most of these are asymptomatic, except when they have reached perhaps the sixth decade when they can become symptomatic due to cardiac failure secondary to these intrahepatic shunts. Doppler findings, a hepatic artery that is greater than 10 millimeters is the hallmark, and we should then seek shunts within the liver because this is considered a hypertrophied hepatic artery. So either isolated shunts or these related to Osler Weber Rendu. This is a second case of uh, Osler Weber Rendu he has a known Osler Weber and do. He has experienced multiple bouts of epistaxis, which we know is the manifestation most commonly associated with this entity. He comes from the Basque region of Spain, where several family members have been documented, and his uh, physician wanted to know 
if we could just assess the caliber of his hepatic artery to see if he happens to have hepatic involvement. This is the great scale uh, study of this patient, and you can see that the hepatic artery is not markedly increased in size. The portal vein is seen posterior to it, and on color Doppler, perhaps mildly hypertrophied above the 6 millimeter value, but not significantly enlarged yet. He did not have intrahepatic shunts that we could identify at the time of surveillance. So Osler Weber ran due with multiple hepatic arteriovenous malformations. Case number three is also very rewarding. This child was only uh, seven years old when he had to undergo an MRI study due to seizures. He had uh, a behavior of restlessness, which uh, was very uh, difficult to handle by his parents. The MRI study demonstrated high signal intensities in the globus pallidi, and these were bilaterally and nearly symmetric. These are known to occur when there is a liver dysfunction to the point where manganese and magnesium deposit in the globa, globus pallidi. So because of this finding, it was recommended that uh, liver disease be excluded on this patient. The initial, initial, initial sonogram uh, was aimed at uh, assessing for biliary atresia and uh, they did document the presence of a well-developed gallbladder and no signs of uh, liver dysfunction. The liver appeared normal. The restlessness of the child was a, an issue, so we asked that the mother send the child for a meal, and when the child returned, he was more cooperative. At this point, we did a very detailed surveillance of the liver and noted that we could not identify the intrahepatic portal branches. Instead, what we saw were linear echogenic areas where the intrahepatic portal veins should have been present. So the absence of the intrahepatic portal veins led us to seek what could be happening to uh, flow from the portal system, from the gut, from the splenic vein into the liver. And as we sought to explain the, the finding, we realized that we could see a portion of the extrahepatic portal vein, but its direction was towards the inferior vena cava rather than towards the porta hepatis. So on color Doppler, you can see the anomalous direction the main portal vein achieves towards the inferior vena cava rather that, than into the intrahepatic region. So this anomalous communication of the portal vein with the intrahepatic uh, segment of the IVC was uh, due to a uh, congenital portal cavo shunt. In grayscale, you can see that the portal vein has an aneurysmal component and at which point it, it has an anomalous course and anastomosis with the intrahepatic inferior vena cava. So this is a congenital portal cable shunt displayed here in color Doppler very elegantly. When we sampled with spectral Doppler the flow was very chaotic because we had this aneurysmal component and we had uh, spectral waveforms that were a combination of the portal venous components and parts of the cable flow. So very turbulent flow through this extrahepatic portal cable shunt. This congenital portal cable shunt was described by Abernathy in 1793. The fact that the child had these high signal intensity areas in the globus pallidi and high levels of uh, serum ammonia was uh, resulting in him having seizures because he really had bouts of hepatic encephalopathy. This finding of um, uh, deposition of magnesium and uh, manganese in the globus pallidi can be found in patients with liver dysfunction. It's very prevalent in alcoholics, 
aren't patients on parental nutrition. Our case reflects absence of the normal metabolic pathways for the clearance of these metals due to the presence of this portal cable shunt. The Abernathy malformation has two versions. Type 1 has absence of the intrahepatic portal veins. Flow is redirected into the IVC, and this can be isolated. But in females, unfortunately, they have associated anomalies. They have polysplenia, biliary atresia, and liver tumors. Type 2 is just an extrahepatic connection between the main portal vein and the retrohepatic IVC. This is the type we have in our patient. It occurs in males without associated anomalies. The etiology of the Abernathy malformation is thought to be excessive involution of the periintestinal vitelline venous loop or total failure of the vitelline veins to establish an estomosis with the hepatic sinusoids or hepatic veins. Additional intrahepatic portal systemic shunts have been classified and according to PARC, type 1 would be a single large tube that connects with the right portal vein with the inferior vena cava. Type 2 would be peripheral shunts within a single hepatic segment. And type 3, portal systemic shunts through an aneurysm Type 4, multiple communications between peripheral portal and systemic veins. So this was a case of congenital portal cable shunt, also termed Abernathy malformation. The child was sent for a hepatic transplant because long-term he would have high risks of developing hepatocellular carcinomas. Case number four is an elderly female with congestive heart failure. Grayscale uh, sonography of the liver demonstrates very engorged hepatic veins due to her long-standing congestive heart failure. As we evaluate these hepatic veins in more detail, we uh, identify aneurysmal dilatation of the right hepatic vein and an anomalous communication with a middle hepatic vein. This is uh, described in association with chronic significant tricuspid regurgitation, which this patient had. On power Doppler, we can see very well the aneurysmal dilatation of the right hepatic vein and its anomalous communication with the middle hepatic vein. Spectral Doppler demonstrates typical waveforms of the hepatic vein and accentuated flow during atrial systole due to the regurgitation from the tricuspid regurgitation down the hepatic veins. Intrahepatic venous collateral secondary to chronic tricuspid regurgitation. This was described by Middleton using color Doppler, just similar to the case we have. And this is thought to be secondary to hepatic venous congestion. Case number five is a patient suspected of having cholangial carcinoma. The patient was to undergo liver biopsy. Prior to coming to sonography, the patient had undergone a CT, which we display here. We're on the early arterial phase. We can see the cortical enhancement of the kidneys and hepatic uh, enhancement, hepatic artery enhancement, and multiple low attenuating areas in the hepatic parenchyma of variable shapes, associated ascites. Portal hypertension and enlarged spleen is seen. We can also note that there are some areas of peripheral enhancement relative to these low attenuating areas in the liver. Note that segments 2 and 3 are very large, so is the caudate lobe, consistent with her portal hypertension. An MR had also been done, and again, on the early phases of gadolinium infusion, multiple low signal intensity areas were seen in the liver, but we could not convince ourselves that they corresponded to any type of pattern that we could uh, accept as being 
uh, diagnostic for any entity. So at this time, we were a little concerned because some of the findings uh, suggested dilated uh, biliary segments. And we noted on delayed uh, studies that there were areas of retention near the porta hepatis. So for this reason, we were considering as a possibility underlying cholangiocarcinoma. When we studied the patient with grayscale, we noted that in the enlarged segments two and three, there were very unusual patterns of uh, decreased echogenicity surrounding the portal vein, venous uh, regions. And as we used color Doppler, we could see numerous shunts within the hepatic parenchyma. And as we surveyed the liver in greater detail, these shunts were present also in the right hepatic lobe. These shunts were associated with ascites. And as we saw, the patient had cirrhotic features and had portal hypertension. Again, throughout the hepatic parenchyma, multiple shunts that we could identify unequivocally with color Doppler, since we do not have to time ourselves with the infusion of contrast like CT and MR have to uh, do. So the presence of these shunts could not be documented on either CT or MR convincingly, but could be unequivocally diagnosed on color Doppler. Some of these shunts extended beyond the hepatic capsule, as you can see here. Upon retrospective review of her MRs and CTs, we realized that what we were dealing with was Bud Chiari. We could never identify the intrahepatic segment of the portal vein or the hepatic veins. So this patient had uh, been suspected of having cholangiocarcinoma, but we could eventually realize that portions of her intrahepatic cava were thrombosed, especially at the confluence with the hepatic veins. And we could also identify the dilated azygous vein due to the lack of egress of blood out of the liver via the cava and hepatic veins. So this is the shunts associated with Bud Chiari that on CT and MR, because we had not carried the study to the very late phases of contrast, we could not determined that they were due to venous shunts in the liver and not liver masses. Case number six, a patient with liver disease. And now we're looking at the pancreas. And on grayscale, we can identify the region of the pancreas, but instead of seeing the normal gland, what we're seeing are tubular structures that are unechoic, serpiginous, that would make us concerned for vascular channels. Indeed, putting color Doppler, we identify multiple vascular channels in the expected location of the pancreatic gland. CT, on the early arterial phase, we can see cortical enhancement, so we're very early in the bolus, the hepatic artery is here, but we can see numerous vascular channels in the region of the pancreatic gland. In fact, on this uh, lower image, we can very clearly identify these vascular channels that superimpose the region of the pancreas. And as we follow the porta hepatis, we can see the hepatic artery of normal caliber. And yet, in the region of the portal veins, we have very dilated structures that are not the normal portal veins. So what we're looking at are varicosities in the region of the pancreas secondary to a cavernous transformation of the portal vein. Another finding that substantiates the presence of portal vein thrombosis is the presence of pericholecystic varices. You can see them against the lateral wall of the gallbladder. So the cavernous transformation has resulted in numerous dilated channels in the region of the pancreas. And notice that we also do not identify the splenic vein, 
which has also undergone thrombosis, and perhaps this is the reason why the cavernoma extends to incorporate portions of the pancreatic gland. Now, if we had imaged this patient on a very delayed CT, like we see here when the kidneys are already filtering the iodine, we would have failed to recognize these varicosities. Obviously, now with these faster scanners, we take advantage of uh, boluses during the arterial phase and uh, also portal venous phase. Now, a combined set of images showing you the CT findings in comparison with the color Doppler findings, which are quite uh, comparative. So portal and splenic vein thrombosis result in cavernous transformation and pancreatic varicosities due to the cavernoma extending to the region of the pancreas. The presence of associated splenic vein thrombosis explains the reasons why the patient developed pancreatic varicosities. Case number seven is a 58-year-old female with hematuria. The study was uh, performed in the emergency room, an excretory urogram. The patient had no history of trauma, but the urology resident told me that he could feel a pulsatile mass in her right flank. Note that the left kidney has already begun to clear the iodine, and there's a normal collecting system on the left. Yet, where we expect the right kidney to be located, we have an enlarged kidney that has not yet filtered contrast. And on a more delayed uh, set of images, we do see hydronephrosis of the left kidney, of the right kidney, sorry. A CT was uh, performed because of the clinical suspicion that something was very unusual because a pulsatile mass could be felt on this patient's flank. The patient denied trauma. The only uh, finding or symptom she had of recent uh, was that she could no longer use her usual clothing pieces because her girth, abdominal girth, had increased. So we uh, initially interpreted uh, the findings related to the right kidney as those of a renal cell carcinoma with uh, probably venous involvement of the inferior vena cava because the inferior vena cava was quite large. However, because of the pulsatile nature of this uh, process, the urology resident uh, asked could we further evaluate this patient, and we, of course, had already given iodine, so we couldn't repeat the CT. We brought the patient to ultrasound. Grayscale demonstrates a tubular structure that extends beyond the contours of the patient's right kidney. A small area of calcification with ring-down artifact is identified, and when we evaluated the patient with color Doppler, we realized this represented a renal arteriovenous malformation. Now, in earlier days, uh, arteriovenous malformations were confused for hydronephrosis of the kidney because they simulated the cystic areas in the region of the sinus. But you can see here, color Doppler gives us this advantage of unequivocally documenting the presence of this arteriovenous malformation. The patient was then uh, evaluated with angiography for the possibility of uh, coil embolizing this large arterial venous malformation. However, the caliber of the renal artery supplying this arterial venous malformation exceeded the size of the coils available at that time. The risk was that the coil could migrate into this vascular malformation or into other channels and then embolize. So, Instead of undergoing coil embolization, the patient underwent a nephrectomy. So here's a composite showing this renal arteriovenous malformation, most likely congenital because there was no previous history of biopsy or trauma. The grayscale study, which we reviewed, the color Doppler, the uh, CT, which shows enhancement to the same degree as vascular structures of these areas in the, liver, in the uh, kidney. So the hypertrophied hepatic artery seen by arteriography and the 
inability to coil embolize this arteriovenous malformation. The classification of renal arteriovenous malformations depend on their location and extent. Some peripheral arteriovenous malformations are near the caliceal system. They're called central when they're near the renal pelvis. Extensive if they extend from the calis, calyx to the renal pelvis. They're called aneurysmal arteriovenous malformation if there's a single feeding artery and a single draining vein. They're referred to as angiomatous if there's a single feeding artery and multiple draining veins. And cirsoid arteriovenous malformations when there are multiple feeding arteries and multiple draining veins. Case number eight is a patient with right flank pain. The patient uh, undergoes ultrasound evaluation and using color Doppler, we note the normal vascular structures that are portrayed in red and blue. Yet, if we analyze this image, there is a, another interesting finding. We have a group of echoes that are trailing, are becoming less in width. They have a mosaic of colors. And this is due to the presence of a calculus. Here we see in grayscale that same area with an associated acoustic shadow. And taking advantage of color Doppler, we can identify renal calculi better by using color Doppler to demonstrate the twinkle artifact. This is due to the multiple reverberations of the signal as it bounces from the front to the back, front to the back of this calculus. So taking advantage of color Doppler to identify renal calculi is a very significant contribution of, of uh, sonography. Now what about this case? We're looking at the left kidney and we see mosaics of color throughout the uh, region of the left kidney. Is this an arteriovenous malformation? Or what could be happening? Well, in fact, this is a large calcification. And what we were looking at is a twinkle artifact. Notice the cluster of calculi in this kidney. And this was not an arteriovenous malformation. We see the cortex well enhanced. This was just a cluster of cal uh, calcifications. So the twinkle artifact is useful to identify renal calculi in the kidney. Case number nine is an abdominal sonogram, and this is a, a left kidney. And as we look at the left kidney, we see a nice homogeneous renal cortex, and we can identify the medullary pyramids, yet we see, similar to the uh, uh, renal cortex, an area that protrudes into the region of the renal sinus. So what could this be? And we can see that it communicates with the renal cortex but extends a little bit more medial towards the sinus region. It's very important to recognize this finding because it's a variant of normal. And if you put color, you can see that it does not cause any displacement of the renal vessels. The renal vessels come out of this region without any mass effect. And they're normal arterial flow uh, can be demonstrated on spectral Doppler. This is a column of Bertin. The isoechoic nature relative to the renal cortex of this column is key in arriving at the diagnosis of this normal variant of the kidney. This results from the invagination of the renal cortex towards the renal sinus region. Case number 10 is an abdominal sonogram. And now we're looking at the segment 6 of the liver in the right kidney. And as we analyze the kidney, we again can find the normal architecture of the renal cortex and medullary regions. But don't stop there. Look at the sinus of the kidney. And as we an analyze the renal sinus, we now see a hypoechoic mass within the renal sinus. And this mass is rather homogeneous 
and there, is, there are small cysts in the renal cortex. So we should not be distracted by the cysts because the most significant finding is this mass in the renal sinus. It measured 2.9 by 1.8 centimeters, and on color Doppler, we could not demonstrate flow within the mass, but the mass was unequivocally solid. And additional evaluation led us to recognize further the small cyst adjacent to the mass, but patient was sent for additional evaluation. On non-contrast CT, the mass is isodense to the renal parenchyma. Note the presence of the small cyst adjacent to the mass. On arterial phase CT, we see the normal renal cortex and medullary pyramids, yet the region of the mass does not enhance and does not demonstrate the normal architecture of the renal cortex. So we don't have the enhancement, if this was a column of Bertin, we should have seen the normal enhancement of the cortex. So here's the cyst. And as we carry the study further on to later phases of contrast delivery, the mass exhibited then a very heterogeneous enhancement. The normal renal parenchyma is in the nephrogram phase, yet the mass is heterogeneous with uh, multiple areas of enhancement. Notice the phase of contrast here is already the excretory phase. So a mass in the renal sinus region. And here is the cyst and the mass. This is biopsy proven oncocytoma. Now oncocytomas do have a central scar which we may or may not appreciate. This happened to be a rather small oncocytoma. So this is biopsy proven and I think the patient has already undergone additional surgical management. Case number 11. This patient has been hypertensive since age 33. She had undergone evaluation at that early uh, age, but no uh, findings could explain her hypertension. She had undergone a CT study at uh, the time of uh, complete evaluation. She now presents with gross hematuria. This is a CT obtained in the emergency room, and notice that the right kidney is already excreting contrast. The left kidney is retaining contrast. There has been intervention by the urologist who placed a stent and who could not visualize on endoscopy the cause of this massive bleeding the patient was undergoing. Well, we had just uh, had the other case of renal arteriovenous malformation, so he asked could we evaluate the patient with, with sonography and color Doppler to see if she had any cause for a bleeding uh, in her left kidney. So we see here the clot filled the renal pelvis with the stent and uh, the delayed nephrogram due to the obstructive uh, changes secondary to the hemorrhage. Now, in retrospect, uh, we're looking at the sinus region of the lower pole of this patient's left kidney. Now, I uh, magnify this area so that we could appreciate the serpiginous areas in the sinus of this uh, left kidney. An astute sonographer had documented the findings, but on color Doppler, and in retrospect, I collected the grayscale feature so we could look at it in, in a more detailed fashion. So on power Doppler, we see the normal architectural uh, arrangements of the vascular structures of the right kidney, the normal kidney. And yet, when we looked at the left kidney, there were clusters of uh, vascular channels in the lower pole. And these are related to a small arteriovenous malformation in the lower pole of this left kidney. The patient, um, as we mentioned, had undergone previous complete evaluation because of her hypertension that could not be explained. However, in those uh, days, a CT was rather 
limited the uh, slower nature of the uh, scanners would not allow us to identify some of these arteriovenous malformations because we would uh, image uh, too late to note the presence of these vascular channels. But on spectral Doppler, I just wanted to show you that the inelasticity of these vessels that compose the arteriovenous malformation results in very low resistance, chaotic flow patterns because of the flabby nature of the arterial uh, walls. So here's the normal right kidney. The focal area of a cluster of vessels secondary to the arterial venous malformation in the lower pole and the spectral Doppler with the very low resistant, uh, resistance waveform. Arteriography did demonstrate a cirsoid arterial venous malformation, multiple feeding arteries and multiple draining veins. That is termed cirsoid. Notice that the main renal artery supplies the superior portions of the arterial venous malformation, but an accessory renal artery supplies the lower portion of this arterial venous malformation. Well, consideration was given to coil embolization, but it had to be done with super selective technique. The concern was that they embolized the lower component of this arterial venous malformation. Could they compromise flow to the renal pelvis and proximal ureter? So the patient underwent selective coil embolization successfully, completely occluding the entire arterial venous malformation, and her renal vascular hypertension was then corrected. So this was a cirsoid renal AVM, which was the cause for long-standing renal vascular hypertension in this 42-year-old female. Case number 12 is a 33-year-old male in renal failure referred, referred for renal biopsy. We by now uh, had uh, experience with two arterial venous malformations, and we were considering uh, arterial venous malformation when our sonographer pointed out that what appeared to be a simple cyst adjacent to the right kidney, in fact, had vascular channels leading to it, so it was not a cyst. And uh, these vascular channels had very low resistivity to flow suggesting that this was, again, another arterial venous malformation. We uh, suggested that the patient undergo MR because the patient was in renal failure, and the MR arteriography was completely normal. Surprising all of us, there was no findings to suggest the right arterial venous malformation. But my astute colleague decided to repeat the MR, and bring the patient, but image during the venous phase of contrast. And it was apparent then that the patient had caval interruption with azygous continuation that led back into the left atrium. There was never an identifiable if you're vena cava uh, through the liver. And so these, uh, these renal veins were constituting this uh, channel of uh, vessels we saw cephalad to the right kidney. So all the renal venous egress took place through these convoluted varices along the upper pole of the right kidney. So cable interruption with azygous continuation and large suprarenal varices. Case number 13 is a 13-year-old male with hypertension and we look at his right kidney, which appears relatively normal, but his left kidney is grossly abnormal. We're unable to identify the sinus region of the kidney, the renal cortex, and medullary pyramids. Because he was hypertensive, we had to do further surveillance for an explanation, which could be due to a renal cause for his hypertension. So the central region of the left kidney was grossly abnormal. We could never identify medullary pyramids, renal cortex, or renal pelvis. 
vessels could be seen coursing through this anomalous area in the kidney, but we needed to have further evaluation and we opted to have CT studies done on the child. As we were looking at his renal arteries, we identified normal velocities in his main renal artery that was 99.6 centimeters per second. So we still didn't have a good explanation for what was that area that had an abnormal echo texture in his left kidney. So here's the left renal artery in its mid portion, has a normal appearance. The renal vein was patent and it was also normal. His right kidney had a normal distribution of intrarenal vessels with arteries and veins readily perceptible. And the right renal hilum was normal with the renal artery of normal caliber in the draining vein. The right renal artery had a velocity of 70 centimeters per second, also in the normal range. So as we did his CT, we realized that the left kidney was very abnormal in appearance with a central area of uh, uh, enhancement corresponding to the renal cortex, but there was also a low attenuation area partially calcified in the posterior aspect of this left mid kidney, which we felt was uh, probably an area where this patient's left kidney had been traumatized and had healed in an anomalous fashion and had resulted in a partially calcified uh, hepa uh, renal um, hematoma. So we thought maybe he had sustained a partial fracture during the trauma and had not realized that this had happened and was now with uh, ischemic changes of his uh, left kidney and resulting renal vascular hypertension. This is another patient with a similar situation. She has a calcified subcapsular renal hematoma. And as we know, page kidneys are associated with renal vascular hypertension. So this patient has unequivocally a subcapsular calcified renal hematoma and resultant hepat uh, renal vascular hypertension. This is a patient, uh, case number 14, pregnant with left flank pain. We can see an early pregnancy, 26-year-old male, a uh, female, obese, with left flank pain and was thought to have pyelonephritis. The kidney was seen to be engorged, enlarged, and perirenal fluid could be identified. This kidney measured 14.3 centimeters. So what would be the differential diagnosis of unilateral renal enlargement? Well, we excluded hydronephrosis and we excluded masses. So a possibility is to be considered compensatory hypertrophy, but she had a normal right kidney. A duplicated system of this kidney, we could not identify that. Pilo, renal vein thrombosis, or acute renal infarction. So the patient was brought back, and evaluation with color Doppler demonstrated a patent renal artery, yet adjacent to the renal artery, we could never identify flow in the renal vein. Here we can see the renal artery of normal caliber, but adjacent to it, we should have seen the renal vein, and we did not appreciate flow in the renal vein. So this patient was pregnant and had renal vein thrombosis. She was subsequent uh, diagnosed with thrombophilic condition. This is another example of renal vein thrombosis. Noted, notice the irregularity of the margins of the renal vein due to the presence of thrombus. This is that same patient when he was more acutely ill. You can see the entire renal vein is thrombosed. It was distended, measured 13 millimeters, and he also had associated inferior vena cava thrombus. So the second patient with renal vein thrombosis is this younger male that we're discussing now. So extension of the renal vein thrombus into the inferior vena cava. And he had glomerulonephritis, had undergone a CT, and we could see the uh, enlarged 
left renal vein due to the underlying nephropathy that he was presently being worked up for. So renal and inferior vena cava thrombosis. This patient is uh, evaluated prior to cardiac transplantation. And we tell the uh, cardiologist taking care of the patient that she has a very echogenic mass in her right kidney, a very large mass, and that we were concerned for an angiomyolipoma. You can see the nature of the angiomyolipoma, some distortion of the uh, sound beam, loss of the back wall because of the fatty nature of the lesion. And as we know, um, the average speed of sound transmission in our systems is uh, 1,540 meters per second, which is the average speed of sound in our tissues. Yet adipose tissues have a slower speed of sound transmission. Average is 1,450 meters a second. This slower transmission through fat results in an apparent delay uh, of returning signals that cause uh, fatty masses to appear larger than their true size. Here's the CT on that same uh, patient that is about to receive a cardiac transplant. You can see the low attenuation nature of the mass. It's quite large. There are some intrinsic uh, areas that are higher in attenuation, and this is uh, the angiomyolipoma. Well, the patient underwent cardiac transplant, and then subsequent to the transplantation, she uh, was uh, placed on uh, Coumadin, and she experienced severe right flank pain, and we were asked to reassess the uh, angiomyolipoma. And, of course, the anticoagulation resulted in hemorrhage into this angiomyolipoma. These uh, masses are known to have small uh, uh, aneurysms, and, again, their walls, the uh, angiomatous components, within an angiomyolipoma has these vessels that are very uh, uh, flabby and cannot sustain a lot of changes in pressure and can bleed very, very readily. And the present recommendation is four centimeters or greater, these angiomyolipomas should be selectively embolized to prevent a, a catastrophic event. So here is the angiomyolipoma following its intrinsic hemorrhage due to anticoagulation therapy. You can see on the CT similar findings. It now has changed its characteristics with some residual low attenuation areas, but higher attenuation areas compose now the mass due to the presence of associated hemorrhage. So we know that these uh, elastin-poor vascular structures in angiomyolipomas can sustain spontaneous hemorrhage. In our case, the hemorrhage was triggered by the anticoagulation. So we now know that lesions that exceed 4 centimeters are best embolized. So renal angiomyolipoma with bleeding. Case number 15 and last case of my series is of a patient that has right flank pain. On grayscale, we would have called this a normal kidney, which we did. Yet the clinician was astute because the patient was experiencing a lot of discomfort, and he opted for a CT. Notice that the kidney size is also preserved, 12.9 by 4.7. And yet on CT, this kidney is completely infarcted. So a global infarction of the right kidney has occurred. Now, Infarcts early on may not alter the echo texture of the uh, region of interest, so I caution you if the patient is symptomatic enough that either you put color, make sure the vessels are patent, which we didn't do at that time, so we didn't uh, quite achieve the best diagnosis on the patient. So this is a global renal infarct, not perceptible on grayscale alone. So again, the value of color Doppler in abdominal sonography is a very important uh, component of our evaluation of patients with conditions that vary from uh, kidneys, liver, uh, spleen, anywhere where vascular 
uh, evaluation can uh, result in the correct diagnosis. Thank you very much.